gotta run the race. Run the race. You gotta fight the fight. Fight the fight. You gotta keep the faith, and I know it'll be all right. Oh yeah, you gotta run the race. Run the race. You gotta fight the fight. Fight the fight. You gotta keep the faith, and I know it'll be all right. Now there'll be lots of people in this place, and I'm sure you recognize when you see their face. And you walk on streets that's paved with gold, live in a land where you'll never go old. Do you wanna go to heaven when you die? Come on, you gotta run the race. Run the race. You gotta fight the fight. Fight the fight. You gotta keep the faith, and I know. Oh yes, you gotta run the race, fight, keep the faith, and I know it'll be all right. Great words. You found the Corinth Baptist Church Senior Adult Sunday School class in Singleton, Mississippi. Today's lesson is entitled "Pressing Toward the Goal." This is going to be our fourth and final lesson in a series under the general heading of. Paul in prison. We'll be drawing our scripture today from the third chapter of the book of Philippians. I wonder, have you ever paused to contemplate just exactly what the Christian life really is? I mean, how is the Christian's outlook on life different from that of the world's? At some point in their walk with Jesus, every Christian will probably ask themselves these very questions. Paul understood how the gospel transforms a person's life. In this letter to the Philippians, Paul discusses the contrast between a Christian's worldview versus that of a person who doesn't know Christ. We have a different mindset toward our past we have different motivations and goals for the future as well. Because of our relationship with the risen Jesus, we have that certain confidence that we'll experience one day the promise of the resurrection. Not only do we know in our very hearts that there will be a resurrection, we know that the event will be one that Jesus raises us up to be with him forever. The apostle described life in Christ as running a race, a race in which we press on toward a goal of fully knowing Jesus as we hope for the final victory of our glorified bodies, the final victory of our glorified bodies bodies. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Our perseverance in the race reminds us that Jesus and his endurance of the cross is the thing that provided forgiveness of our sins and our salvation. Now Paul was born into the tribe of Benjamin. He had grown up learning the law from Gamaliel who was one of the most renowned teachers of his day. Now, Paul was born a Pharisee. He considered himself a righteous man and wholeheartedly persecuted the early church, considering it to be blasphemous. That all changed, of course, on the road to Damascus, where he had once persecuted the church after his conversion for the rest of his life, he himself was persecuted by those who had once been his comrades. Before his conversion, his confidence was in himself and in the law of Moses, but now he trusted in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Now, how is such a transformation possible? The Gospel. Section 1 of our lesson for today is entitled, Run the Race Without Hindrances. It's going to be coming out of Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. But everything 
that was gained to me, I have considered to be lost because of Jesus, because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being, com being conformed to his death, assuming <clears throat> that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. <clears throat> As I said earlier, Paul described life as a Christian as someone who is running a race. The runners need a focused outlook. Therefore, they must lay aside everything that slows them down or hinders them. So what slows down or hinders a Christian? Well, mainly sins and distractions. In our last lesson, I identified sin as a spiritual power. But let's look at the subject of sin a little closer, shall we? Sin traps people, both believers and non-believers alike. It holds sinners in a cycle of guilt and shame. It weighs down a person who wants to obey the Lord. It saps the believer's energy and destroys the motivation to run the race or to live with the power of endurance for the remainder of his days. We just can't run the race of a Christian life and hold on to the weights of sin. We can't do it. Then there's distractions. The main hindrance in this passage of scripture is that of distraction. Even good things that could keep our eyes off of Jesus. Paul recognized that all his religious background and credentials as a Jew and specifically a Pharisee ultimately were worthless when compared to the value of knowing Jesus. Now Paul had a pedigree he was proud of the fact that he was born into the tribe of Benjamin, that he had been circumcised on the eighth day, just as the law prescribed, of the reputation that he had among his peers, and the wealth of knowledge and wisdom that he had obtained from one of the most prominent teachers of his day. These were his riches. And these were the things that he gladly set aside in pursuit of Christ. As Christians today, we should always be aware of the things we've been blessed with and take care that none of them distract us from the prize we ultimately want to possess. And that's life eternal with our Lord. Can't we more easily lay aside our hindrances when we understand the all-surpassing value of knowing Jesus and his righteousness? There's nothing in our own merit or good work that can cause us to inherit in eternal life. Our only hope is the righteousness of Jesus that we've been given because of our faith in Christ. Paul taught that religion, regulation, and rituals wouldn't do any good in making us right with God. He taught that righteousness is a gift from God and by His grace through faith in Jesus. 
This is just so important to understand. Christians don't work for salvation, but instead we work out our salvation to make Christ more evident in our lives to become Christ-like. We don't do this by looking at the Christless world that's around us, but by fixing our eyes on Christ himself. As Christians, we aren't shackled by guilt and shame because we're free from our sin in Christ. We know we can't earn God's righteousness, and we know that we can't lose it. Our salvation, which is by God's grace alone, through our faith alone, shows us that we're loved unconditionally by our God, the creator of everything, the master of everything, and the only one who has the power to give us a future that we simply cannot completely understand yet. The, ne uh, the next section of our lesson is entitled, Run the Race, Pressing Forward Toward the Goal. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Now that I've already reached the goal, I'm sorry, let me start over. <clears throat> Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it and because I also have been taken hold of by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. I'm stumbling today. I'm sorry, folks. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what's ahead, I pursue my goal as the I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Boy, oh boy, did I slaughter that section of scripture, but I'm going to leave it there in the video. We're going to go on. The Christian life, it's one of discipline and striving toward a goal. It's not easy. It requires effort. Doesn't everything of any value require effort? Of course it does. It's like the athletic imagery Paul uses in this passage of scripture. We can't coast through this race, but we must pursue the prize. Yet we do so because the prize has already been won for us. Jesus ran the perfect race all the way to the finish line to assure us that our goal would be waiting for us. <clears throat> so we can, we can forget the past with all of its failures and heartaches and press forward in forgiveness with confidence knowing what we're aiming for. As much as Paul had already accomplished in the kingdom of God, he never gave any indication that he thought he had completed his race. Just as Paul, we must understand that our Christian life starts and ends with humility and repentance. It's error for a Christian to consider themselves saved. We're on the path to salvation. None of us can or will ever reach the highest point of Christian maturity. We can't coast. The Great Commission still stands. We're to be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone God puts in our path. And we're to be sensitive to his promptings. Now that's one that I'm still working on and probably will be until the end of my days. Anyway, whether we consider our lives 
before coming to Christ as good or bad, dwelling on those memories can be a distraction. We can't stand on our laurels and we can't let the memories of wicked past hinder us. Leave them behind and go on. I can tell you from personal experience, dwelling on the memories of my life before coming to Christ or even on the mistakes that I've made since then definitely can be distractions. Memories of our past can cloud our vision of what God has in store for us based on the teaching of His Word and the leading of His Spirit. Focusing on our past before Christ could sidetrack us with guilt, shame, embarrassment. Leave it back there. And at the same time, we could even let a wrong focus on the future, aside from Christ, of course, fill us with anxiety, fear, and confusion. When I look at what's going on in this world today, it would be easy to get really upset about it. Focus on Christ. He's in control. When we look upward to Christ, we're encouraged onward in hope and joy. We've talked about sanctification before, but I don't want to pass up this opportunity to point out something Scripture says about it. As believers, we're already sanctified, but it's also an ongoing process. It affects the whole person. It transforms our hearts, our minds, and our character to reflect the image of Jesus. So Paul writes in Philippians that he runs this race to gain the prize. But what is the prize? Seems silly to ask the question, doesn't it? Yet, it's a question whose answers we should all be in agreement on. He said he counted everything he was and everything he had before as loss so that he might gain Christ. Kind of like selling all your pearls to buy that one super pearl. He also plainly tells us that he wanted to experience the resurrection of the dead unto eternal life. Now, I'm with him, what he said. Gaining Christ is gaining his resurrection and it's gaining every other promise too. Now look, the power to run and persevere in this race can't come from us, but from God. It's the power of God in Jesus Christ as though the whole and through the Holy Spirit that makes possible our salvation and our sanctification. It strengthens all of us for the ministry of the gospel. It was God's grace that started us on this race. It's God's grace that sustains us as we run it. It's his forgiveness that allows us to forget what's behind and press on toward the prize. It's the prize of resurrection and eternal life for believers that drives us forward. So what are some ways a Christian can run this race? I mean, what are some tangible ways that we can actually live Christian lives? Well, to start with, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Jesus has forgiven us for the sins of our past. Certainly. Certainly, we can find it in our hearts to also forgive others who have done things against us. We can be compassionate towards others, 
to give or to serve those around us. Give to or serve those around us. We can give a helping hand to those that are less fortunate than us. We can help resupply those who have suffered loss from storms, fires, floods, and the like. We can serve our local church. We can proclaim the gospel to unbelievers. We can pray for God to show us the sins in our lives. And we can pray for his direction, for his strength to obey him. The final section of our lesson for today is entitled, Run the Race with Victory in Mind. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this to you also. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of Christ, enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in, the, in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Oh, y'all need to read that over and over and over again. Let it sink in. When it comes to the Christian life, it comes with the expectation to grow into maturity. We are to strive to not only ferret out hidden sins we may not even be aware of, but to continue to grow spiritually. Just as the Hebrew peoples used the law of Moses as a sort of a, a checklist to ensure their obedience to the Lord, we're to open our Bibles and learn about the Lord and about things the various authors of the New Testament wrote under his divine inspiration that teach us about how we are to live. As Christians, we should be striving to see everything in the light of Jesus Christ and the work he did on the cross. When we're focused on the temporary things of this world, we reveal our, our immaturity and quite possibly our unbelief. On the other hand, the maturity and health of a believer is revealed in a mind that is focused on eternal things like the coming of the Savior and the resurrection that he'll bring. In verse 9, Paul warns the Philippians not to stray toward false teachings that directed their focus and energies onto earthly things. Running this race means that we must have the proper mindset. It doesn't mean that we're to ignore or forsake life on this earth. I once knew a woman whose husband told her she was so heavenly minded she was no earthly good. Gotta walk that line. We're to live in this world but not be of it. What we are to do is to take all of the joys of, the, of this world that God created for us and to live in a manner that's worthy of our Creator. How do you do that? Well, you're doing it right now by studying this lesson with me. 
and you're doing it when you pray, when you read God's Word, when you serve others, when you go to church, when you serve your church, when you seek out more mature Christians and imitate them, when you set the example for the younger people in your church, and there's a myriad of other things that are right and good. All living Christians are in the process of salvation. We're justified by our faith in Jesus. God sanctifies us by filling us with his Holy Spirit. And that cleansing power of his Spirit is an ongoing process where we notice that more and more as time goes by, we gain the power to resist sin and the ability to obey his word more and more as time goes by. And then there's glorification. Glorification is the finish line for the Christian runner. Glorification refers to the future time when a Christian reaches moral and spiritual perfection at the time of Christ's return. Glorification also involves the physical perfection that we will have once our bodies have been resurrected. They'll be glorified, we'll be transformed into the likeness of the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day. When we're glorified, we'll have a fuller understanding and a fuller knowledge of God and of his word. Living with the future resurrection in view impacts our present day lifestyles. Those who ignore the future coming of Christ fail to recognize their coming destruction in hell and so continue unabated in their sins. Believers who live with their minds set on the second coming have a vision of their future resurrection in Christ with, and it motivates their pursuit of that promise. In Christ, the victory's already been won, so we can run the race with confidence that we'll be able to complete it. Enemies of the cross live an idolatrous, shameful lifestyle and live for earthly things rather than those that are eternal. They love the things that God hates and hate the things that God loves. They don't know God and are in danger of losing the most precious thing a human being could ever hope for. I won't be, it won't be pretty for those people come judgment day. Paul made it abundantly clear to the church in Philippi. He let them know he himself was strive, still striving for the goal of perfection, but that he had not yet arrived. He wasn't being conceited or boastful or egotistical about his walk with the Lord when he encouraged them to imitate him. But still, he did recognize his life was a good example of what it means to follow Christ because he aimed to imitate Christ himself. As Christians who are maturing in faith, each of us ought to be able to say the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are our God. You are our Master. You are our Savior. You are our Redeemer. And we run to you. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have poured out on us in this world, and even more so, the blessings that you pour out on us spiritually. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to study your word, to learn from your word, and to hear you speak to our hearts the need 
for us to ever press toward you, the prize. Help us cross that finish line, Lord, and be with you forever. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching, and I sure hope you have a good week. I'll see you in a few days. Bye-bye.